much for the rousing uh, introduction. Uh, one correction, and I did change the title of the presentation. Uh, stayed a little bit away from the fret rates, but I'll get in with some comments on the side on the fret rates. Um, this presentation will dovetail with a little bit of the last three. So starting from Lafarge up um, and just kind of continue along. We talked about the prices. We talked about uh, the demand. We talked about the people taking it. We talked about the coal available in the United States. Now I'm going to talk about how to get it out of the United States. Um, this is some company propaganda, and you guys can read that on your own. Um, it's in the little presentation. And I've got a lot of pictures, so I've kept it nice and simple, and hopefully nice and colorful as well. I'll start off with U.S. export figures. Um, I looked at both the coal and the petroleum coke export figures. Uh, on the left, the graph shows you the monthly uh, volumes leaving the United States, and then a trend graph. This is a rolling 12-month amount. And on the right-hand side, I would simply put in where is the majority of this cargo going. So you can clearly see that Europe, or Northern Europe, is the uh, largest taker by far. Uh, Mediterranean, which I broke out separately because the users are going to be different. Uh, different. It's be more of the cement people in the Mediterranean than the Northern Europe. And then broke it down a little bit further. Uh, taking it one step further, I went into looking at each of the uh, basic areas of export. And this is done by how dependent are they, are, are each of these export terminals on one customer or one region of export. So you can see that Mobile almost exclusively exports to Northern Europe, whereas Houston, which is a very, very small uh, market right now, um, is more the Mediterranean. And it, it, this is just to kind of show you that the export patterns are heavily dictated by port and by terminal as well. And I'll, when I go into the actual terminals, it'll be very clear, especially on the coal side, each terminal has its own customer and each customer has its own uh, partners they do business with, and that dictates a lot of where this goes. Uh, the pet coke side, um, similar, uh, much different uh, figures. Um, U.S. Gulf is heavily blessed or cursed with a, a lot of uh, refining capacity. 40% uh, of the U.S. refining capacity is in the U.S. Gulf, which is uh, great for business. A lot of uh, tanker ships coming in, a lot of byproducts going out. Um, for about two months a year, everyone holds their breath when hurricanes get into the U.S. Gulf and prices start going up. But uh, generally, it's a, it's a good place to do business. I uh, looked at the breakdown again um, by location. And again, these are very much restricted based on where the refinery is located. So you can't move refineries very well. Uh, pet coke is generally shipped out from where the refineries are, very close to it. Uh, the exception being to those located on the Mississippi River. But uh, these on the coast have a refinery almost attached to them. Uh, terminal operations is where I want to spend the most of my time. There have been uh, quite a few changes, uh, quite a few uh, new projects being uh, pronounced. Uh, and most importantly, a lot of terminals have upgraded their uh, facilities. This has a huge impact on what can get exported. If you look at the coal market in the United States over uh, traditionally, we were coal importers. All of our terminals for coal were set up to import. Now all of a sudden, we're looking to export this coal. Um, the easiest place to do that, we always exported petroleum coke, so it's easy to take coal out through the same terminal. Um, it's causing a lot of friction between the petroleum coke and the coal producers. Uh, which is starting to be a little more interesting. Um, and it's really constricted the space available in the terminals. And so what I'll do is I'll go through, um, starting in this part of the, the Gulf, and then I'll move my way into the Mississippi River, which is a whole other uh, area that's even more difficult. This just gives you a geographic understanding. Um, Houston is the one in the middle. Uh, you have Corpus Christi on the bottom. It's about a two and a half hour uh, drive by car. And the other one is Beaumont Port Arthur. It's about 90 minutes from Houston driving, uh, assuming no traffic. Um, 
This is Corpus Christi. This is the existing Corpus Christi terminal as it stands today. Um, and in the previous presentation, there was a mention of uh, coal coming out of Colorado. The New Elk coal out of Colorado is going through this terminal. It's just now starting. Uh, you also have Amber Coal, which has announced and actually also signed a uh, long-term lease agreement with the port to also put coal through here. What's very interesting about this is those two groups together have pledged to build their own coal terminal. And by 2017, uh, they plan to put a tremendous amount of coal through that terminal, several million tons a year. Uh, the biggest problem with that is they don't have EPA permitting, and with the situation in the United States, it's going to be very difficult to see long term whether or not that's going to happen. Uh, the other part about that, this is all because of the way Corpus Christi is laid out. This all has to come down by rail. So it's also going to be constricted by rail access and whether or not there's going to be availability of rail cars, et cetera. Uh, Houston Bolt Terminal. This is a rather old facility. Uh, it's actually owned by the Port of Houston, fell in disrepair, and then uh, was activated again. It was built to handle uh, handy-sized ships, not handy max, handy-sized ships uh, back in the day. So it's uh, been upgraded through the years to handle bigger and bigger sized ships. The Port of Houston, this terminal, and the next one are both limited to 40 feet draft. And Corpus Christi, I should have mentioned, is 45 feet draft. Uh, draft will be a big issue that I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, the Houston Bolt Terminal, and one of the biggest customers of this terminal was uh, the Lyondale Cargo, which has moved across the river, and I'll bring that up in the next slide. Uh, but that opened up a storage capacity there, and Peabody Coal is now importing or exporting through this terminal. If you look at the picture on the bottom right, you'll see some railroad tracks that went in, the lighter colored ones. That's all brand new. They can bring in multiple unit trains now. They put in improved dumping facilities, and so they are now pu pushing a, a, a fair amount of coal through here. Um, at 40 feet of draft, it's obviously you're limited to Panamax ships, um, and again, you're competing with the petroleum coke in that terminal for space. Uh, the deep water terminal, also um, in Houston, by air, uh, probably about a mile apart. Uh, this is where the Lyondale cargo went. On the picture to your left, you see a conveyor belt coming in from the right-hand side. That's actually the shell terminal conveyor belt. So the red line shows where the cokers are. The red line is the conveyor belt putting the shell cargo onto the pile directly. The pile next to that is the Lyondale cargo. That comes in on the blue line is a loop track that was built recently. So the train comes in, there's a bottom dump, conveyor belt puts it on the pile. And you'll notice that there's a very large space inside of the blue line, or blue circle. That is where Arch Coal is going to put about 8 million tons of coal in the next couple of years. So all of a sudden, you're going to have you know, 15, 20 million tons of cargo going through this terminal. Again, limited to 40 feet of draft. So we're looking at uh, currently just Panamax is going through here. Uh, Rainbow Terminal, I put this in. This is a petroleum coke. This is a new facility that was uh, just came online uh, last year. This, this is uh, right next to Total's uh, refinery in uh, Port Arthur. They put in a coking unit, and this is the facility that goes along with that. Uh, and it produces about a million tons a year. This is another terminal that just was uh, made public about two weeks ago. Uh, Kinder Morgan has, uh, has an option on a piece of property in the port of Beaumont. There's an existing dock, there's an existing rail access, there's a large pad, um, and they have an option to build a large bulk handling terminal. This would also, they would add two more berths to this uh, facility, so they could handle three berths there total. Beaumont also has a very interesting uh, dredging project in the future where the entire channel may go to 45 and in parts of it even deeper to handle primarily the tanker traffic, but as in a benefit, uh, this bulk terminal would benefit from that. 
and Mississippi River is where all the fun is happening. This is where all the excitement is happening. If you look at the map, the scale on here is very, very hard to understand. On the bottom right hand side, that is where UBT and IMT are located. If you look all the way up to your left, that's Burnside and ICRMT, which is now Convent Marine Terminal. There's a tremendous distance in there that your ship has to travel, or conversely, barges have to travel down. The two terminals on the top left have rail access. The ones down below do not have rail access, that is barge only, which becomes very important later on logistics of getting your coal downstream. If your coal is, uh, can be railed directly to the terminal, that's great, that's one cost. If it has to be railed, then put on barge, then brought down, you have other costs involved with that. So it's something that definitely needs to be considered. And then you also have a fair number of midstream operations. Those are the uh, anchors. Um, there are several different anchor operations or midstream operations, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, the Burnside Terminal, this was a pretty much neglected uh, alumina uh, or met uh, was the producer there. Uh, Trafficker came out and purchased it under their trade name Impala Warehousing. Um, they are now getting into the coal business and will be running coal through that in addition to the alumina. It's interesting that a trader is getting involved. Impala Warehousing also purchased a terminal down in Corpus Christi. Uh, no news yet on what they're going to plan to do with that, but it is another option for someone to export through. Most of the other terminals I'll talk about, there's someone big behind them, a coal uh, producer themselves. So this one looks to be more like a trading position. This one does have rail and will also have midstream operations and they're, they're starting out very slowly right now and then they hope to ramp up production. It's a very old terminal so it's going to need a lot of work. This is the crown jewel all the way on the top. This is the old IC rail. Um, Canadian uh, the, radio, the CN Railroad used to own this. They sold it. Uh, Foresight Energy and Klein both purchased this. Uh, there are plans to run 8 million tons through this on uh, stage one, going up to 16 million tons a year stage two. As you can see, it has a very nice uh, loop track uh, facility, has plenty of room to expand. And it's not an insignificant uh, investment. We're looking at $73 million to bring this up to that high level, high speed. Um, it's a very long voyage for your ship. And you do have to look a little bit into the time. Uh, New Orleans is very, very expensive on pilotage costs. Uh, port costs in general in New Orleans are very high. So going that far up is something to take into consideration. Uh, IMT, uh, some of you might know Kinder Morgan had a uh, problem. Uh, their loader fell onto a ship after a catastrophic failure. They used all of last year to upgrade the facility. They can now unload barges and load ships at the same time, which gives them uh, significant flexibility and speed. They also have a new loading arm. Uh, that's the picture of it on the tug and barge unit to the right. And I have superimposed the little red box is superimposed on a Google map uh, view. That is owned by IMT. That is where they're expanding now to store additional coal. Uh, they've signed up some new customers. One of their customers will be only domestic uh, coal barging operations. The other one will be for export. So if you look at this facility, um, they're expanding their storage capacity tremendously, um, up to 2 million tons a year. St uh, that's just storage. And then export, they have much faster uh, loading operation, they have bigger belts, they put a lot of money into this facility, and they will be pushing a lot of uh, product through here. Oh, sorry, and, and Alpha and Progress Energy are the ones that are the new customers. Uh, UBT, uh, UBT, some of you may not know this, but UBT is up for sale. Uh, UBT is three parts. There's a barging, <coughs> operation that has already been sold to Ingram Barge Company in Tennessee. There's the terminal operation and then UBT also owns US flag vessels which you can kind of see in this picture. Uh, 
not quite sure who would be interested in U.S. flag ships. They're not exactly young or inexpensive to operate, but the terminal um, is getting very close. There are several interested parties that are in the final uh, parts of bidding. Like IMT, this terminal cannot discharge barges and load ships at the same time, which is a significant issue. Uh, that being said, even at that, it can still do almost uh, 10, well, you say about 9 million tons of throughput a year. If they upgrade their system to discharge barges and load ships at the same time, they can double that to about 18 million tons a year using the existing footprint. Um, from what I understand, that's a 60 to $65 million investment. Um, whether that pays off, that'll have to be up to the new owner, but it'd be quite an interesting thing to be able to put 18 million tons through here. Uh, another side note about UBT, one of their <laughs> existing customers uh, now owns the Convent Marine Terminal, or part of it. So they're actually losing a customer because of this additional competition in the river. And they do have a tremendous amount, they own about a thousand acres, or over a thousand acres, so they have almost infinite room to expand, it's just a conveyor belt. You'd have to maybe look at expanding berths. Uh, they can handle cape size vessels at the berth. The only problem is if you put a cape size there, it blocks two berths at the same time, just because of the length of the ship. Uh, midstream operations, uh, there are three midstream operators. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on each of them. I'll just kind of flip through them a little bit. But there are some things to consider with midstream. If you go to a terminal and you buy from a terminal, you will get a rate X to purchase. If you go to a midstream operator, on paper it's gonna look cheaper no matter what. They're always gonna give you a, it's gonna look three, four, five dollars cheaper. But you have to think about other considerations, other items that you have to take into your calculation. Uh, logistics to merge. When you start doing midstream operations, you need to take care of your barges coming downriver. You're not going to be able to, to bring one set of barges to fill a Panamax. So it's going to be five barges today, five barges tomorrow, five, you know, four days from now. They're going to come down all at different times. Well, you only get a certain number of days free, and then you pay to merge after that. Then you have to worry about your ship getting to the buoy on time. And so it's coordinating ship, coordinating barges, and coordinating multiple loads of barges, and all of a sudden, the risk of demerge increases quite a bit. On the cargo side, it's very difficult to sample cargo out of a barge. In the past, what they do is they do a top sample. Um, it's fine to get a content of the coal. The problem is you get no moisture. The coal has been in the barge for days, weeks at a time, and has come down river, uh, the water is settled out. If it has rained along the way, these are open top barges. The water is settled at the bottom. And again, the sample won't have all that water in it. So all of a sudden you're buying water. Because when the scoops, the grabs come in and pick it up, those actually seal off tight where water stays in the bucket. So when it, and you only find this out when it gets delivered um, to your end user. Uh, one of the surveyors has now um, found a way to fix that. It's almost, it's, it's a very small auger that he sticks down the barge, sticks it down, and then takes a sample that way. And that way he can get a, a repetitive sample of the moisture content. The other part that's dangerous is because they're using these big grabs, these big buckets, there could be metal content, there could be wood in there, there could be other contaminants. You can't see that. It doesn't go through a screening process. What's in the bucket gets loaded on the ship. That's, that, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, they do, they can expand their operations relatively quickly. It's about eight to ten million dollars uh, a midstream barge uh, operation. So if they needed more, it'd be fast. If not, uh, these new Gottwald cranes that they use have a speed of about a thousand tons an hour. And if you can put up to four of these cranes on a ship, that's four thousand tons an hour operations, which is a rather good thing. Um, Blending operation is generally done at the same time. Um, if you look at the, was it top right picture, you'll see two different barges next to a crane. If you want a 50-50 blend, you take a scoop out of each barge. Two to one ratio, two buckets to one bucket. So 
and then it mixes it when you actually let it go in the hole. So it's very easy to blend, um, let's say in Houston, they would load it and they would sandwich the cargo. So they'd load one cargo, so 4,000 tons, load another 4,000 tons, and go back with the, the first cargo again, another 4,000 tons, and let the grab at discharge mix it, which is not a very good way of doing it. This is a much better way of, of actually blending the cargo. Um, I won't go through the different uh, providers just for save time, but there is an interesting uh, new facility on the Mississippi River. This is the LMO. Uh, Cooper Consolidated put this into construction or into operation in September of last year. It's a hybrid midstream operation. It's a barge. It discharges uh, coal from um, a barge, puts it into hoppers. There's two hoppers on board, so you can actually use two different types of quality uh, coal, pet coke, and you can do blending that way. So the hoppers can open up at different feed rates. They go onto the same conveyor belt, and that's how they can blend. Uh, the nice thing about this, and you can see quite clearly, it has a conveyor belt on it. You can do uh, surveys during loading, so continuous surveys. Um, it has the magnets, so it picks up all the metal. All the contaminants are gone. And most importantly, the water runs off. The hoppers <coughs> will let the water out. The conveyor belt will let the water fall down. So all of a sudden you get a much more uniform, it's almost like going to a normal terminal, a land-based terminal, without having to store the material on land. And now some new terminal updates. Oil tanking, which most of you would look at me and say, this is not a tanker program. Uh, oil tanking, all I know is they have tanks, they have facilities. Oil tanking got into the dry bulk market several years ago. They do uh, stevedoring, or stevedoring operations in Corpus Christi and until recently in St. Croix at the Hovenza uh, refinery. As you know, the Hovenza was shut down, um, so they lost that facility. They're very interested in expanding in the dry bulk market, so they have proposed this new terminal um, and are marketing it now to uh, different people. There are actually two um, levels. Phase one will be three and a half to five million tons a year. Um, the piles that are shown here are little 100,000 ton piles. Ideally, what they were waiting for was coal to push the petroleum coke people out. Um, but these can be reconfigured for coal or petroleum coke, it doesn't matter. Um, and because it's a greenfield site, it can be configured to your specifications. Um, no word yet on whether or not this will proceed forward, but it is located um, right next to IMT, right across the river from UBT. So it's very low on the river. Um, it will not have rail access. Um, so it has the same inherent problems and benefits that UBT and IMT have. But it certainly has space. And phase two would then uh, go up to two million tons a year uh, throughput. No, two million tons stored, so. Uh, the RAM terminal is a, another terminal that has been uh, discussed. Uh, another um, coal producer is involved in this, is Armstrong. They have a small stake in it. They have not purchased the land, they, not, they have not moved any land, they have not purchased any equipment. So this may or may not happen. Um, too early to say. Another project that's on the, uh, that's at least been discussed is um, uh, Louis Dreyfus is also uh, looking around to uh, put in a facility for to handle coal on the Mississippi River. They're even less far along. They haven't even filed anything. Uh, and this all was only filed with the SEC because it's a publicly traded company. Um, and I guess when you look at the proposed terminal uh, infrastructure that has gone in, I'm using just low case uh, scenarios right now. Before this, before the upgrades, you had about 25 million tons of capacity in land-based terminals. Taking the low end only, you go up to 50 million tons. You double the capacity on the Mississippi River. And if you go to the high end, it's two to three times more than that. So there is quite a bit being talked about. Uh, quite honestly, it's going to be the first to build or first to market. Um, if you're late, there's not going to be any cargo to go on there. 
This doesn't take into consideration whether the barging capacity is there, whether the rail capacity is there, or even whether Europe or the rest of the world is willing to buy this coal. Um, as we heard a lot before, a lot of this has to do with the price, the freight rates. These terminals are constricted to Panamax, and Panamax rates are much, much higher than Cape size rates. Which brings me conveniently to Cape size. I did a little, uh, I was interested in what terminals were uh, capable of handling a Cape size ship. And I do need to, was it the fourth column, it says maximum air draft. That is not air draft that you and I understand being air draft. That is the American designation of waterline to top a hatch coming. It's some funny little thing that the U.S. terminals like to use. So it's there because it's important if the air draft of your ship, as defined here, is too high, they can't get the loading arm into your hold and they will reject the ship. This may require you to ballast down. You may need to ballast a hold of the ship down. Um, but it's very, very important. And if you look at it, the older the terminal, the lower that number. Um, most of the newer terminals or the improved terminals, IMT 62 feet, uh, uh, Convent Marine Terminal 66 feet, that's not an issue for a Cape size ship. Um, what is important is looking at the second column, maximum draft. Even if you bring in a baby size cape, you are going to lose, you're going to have a tremendous amount of dead freight when loading. It's just going to happen. We don't have the draft in the U.S. Gulf. Matter of fact, the Mississippi River went from uh, 45 feet, which effectively meant you could uh, take 47 feet of cargo, overnight went down to 42 feet because of a dredging issue. The channel got uh, very narrow, it was 140 feet at one point. Uh, they have now dredged that, it went back up to 44 feet, and two weeks ago it went back up to 45 feet. So it's very important to check if you lose five feet of cargo overnight, that's a, that's a tremendous claim that you have to deal with. Uh, based, on, well, based on the terminal restrictions, what I did is I looked at the exports from Mississippi River of ships larger than uh, Panamax. And so I just did a short period of time. And again, this is when the Mississippi was limited to 44 feet and had not been increased to 45 feet. So if you look at it, for the last three months when I pulled this, you have a, a fair amount of ships that were uh, baby capes that were loading um, good sized cargoes out of the uh, Mississippi River. And a, a point I made earlier was about the uh, freight rates. A uh, Panamax U.S. Gulf Asia uh, runs you somewhere in the mid-40s, uh, 45 through 47 a ton. A Cape size loading in the Mississippi River topping up in Columbia runs you somewhere in the low 30s, so say between 30 and uh, 33. So there's a $10 freight difference just based on ship size. If the Cape size market, if those, I haven't run any of the sensitivity on that, but if the Cape size market comes back and it goes up a little bit, at a certain point becomes uneconomical, but there is a very high sensitivity to freight rates, especially for the Panamax, and that's why the Cape size, even um, light loaded, become very attractive. Which has other people in the marketplace looking to do something in the U.S. Gulf to top up. Um, the top left one is the Coastalary um, top up uh, vessel. You have Oldendorf in here as well. Someone will come into the U.S. market in the U.S. Gulf and put in a facility to do top ups. It's too much money. Um, there's most of the customers are we're looking to Asia or, or even Europe. Those terminals can take big ships. The economics are there to put it into Cape size ships. It's just a matter of getting around the U.S. requirement for Jones Act, which is, requires a U.S. flagship built in the U.S., manned by uh, U.S. seamen. It's very expensive. Um, and if you use a foreign flagship, you have to go much further offshore. So it's when the VLCCs come to the U.S. and they're lighter, it's the exact process backwards. So it remains to be seen who will be first on board on this. 
There is one uh, terminal on the northeast that already does this with a cell phone loader. Um, the cape size fills up, the cell phone loader fills, they go out, and it gets topped up. So in conclusion, there are quite a few um, changes going on in the marketplace. There's quite a few new players, new, uh, new coal producers, new opportunities to purchase. It's just a matter of getting the coal to market and getting it in a, done in such a way where the price for the rail, the price for the barging, the price for the terminaling can compete with that of the current coal producers that are coming to this part of the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Thomas, uh, for, a, for an eye-opening presentation. Um, can you just run past me again the, the act that you suggested uh, that all the vessels that are uh, required to be used in, in some of these transshipments have to be American registered, American owned, American staffed? How does that work? Uh, the U.S. Jones Act requires that any cargo carried from one place in the U.S. to another place in the U.S. have to be built in the United States, crewed in the United States. It's a cabotage law that uh, is supposed to help our uh, shipbuilding out. Yes. Is that an outdated, uh, anti-competitive piece of legislation that ought to be repealed uh, today? Unless you have an, uh, ships operating in that, yes. Right. Monopolies are wonderful things if you're the one with the monopoly. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Pretty much exists in all over the world. Right. Japan yeah, has the same. Japan most has countries. the same system. Most countries do that to protect their domestic shipping. It's very common. Right. Yeah. Right. It's right. For naval wars cause a naval no war with the Netherlands. I just wonder whether what the uh, WTO would say about the system. Well, but every country does it. Australia <laughs> does it too. So, so nobody's particularly complaining? I would guess that, right? Does, doesn't it introduce uh, greater costs for everybody involved? Oh, it definitely increases the cost, but I would say you have the same thing right now with um, airfares. So air carriers, you can only land in the foreign country you go to. You can't actually move passengers uh, within that country, and you have that in Europe as well. Yep. So it's a very similar concept, it's just uh, ocean going. Okay. And you can get a waiver if there's no other ship available in the United States. So when we had the BP oil spill, we were allowed to bring in uh, oil spill equipment because we didn't have any of our own. Gotcha. Um, any other points or questions from the floor? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you.